Notes. Welcome all you out there in Notes land. This is our Enlightenment Notes uh, day one. If you have, um, if you need to slow things down, remember that you can pause it at home. You can skip to a slide that you need to get to. So use these notes however you need. And my fourth period class is going to help us out with this today. All right. So to start out this unit, remind me, what does enlightened mean? What's that? Inspired. Inspired knowledge. knowledge, right? That we're expanding our mind, right? We're expanding our mind. And that can be with books, but it could also be with art or music. We're expanding our mind. And that's what this unit is all about. Now we're going to start out by listing some things that came about because of the Enlightenment. So we're thankful for that. All right, number one, we're going to start seeing constitutions being drawn up. Like the Constitution of the United States was inspired by this time period, which gives people their rights. Number two, we're going to see different forms of government come about, like democracy or a mix of a monarchy and a democracy. People will start to have a voice in their government. We will start to see suffrage in your vocab words. S-U-F-F-R-A-G-E, suffrage for women, different race of people, and even class of people. Does anybody know what suffrage means? Suffrage for women or African Americans in the United States? You are right. Suffrage is the right to vote. Good. Now, in the last, oh, I don't know, since uh, the Civil War, our country has included uh, voting rights for all races, right? We've also included women having the right to vote in the 1900s. During this time period, we're going to see this change. The class societies are going to be allowed to have a say in their government. Before the Enlightenment, it was all about nobles. They're the only ones that basically had a say, or the church. But now people like you and me, everyday people, will have a right to vote. And that's kind of something new. The fourth thing, we will see an end to two things. An end to the power of nobility. and the church. Now we'll still have church, just like we do today, but that church is more of a worship center instead of a place that will kill you if you don't do what they say, right? It won't be a powerhouse anymore. And on a Monday morning, we also are thankful for the beginning of public schools. I know that's hard to say Monday morning, but think about it. Imagine being in a country where you guys wouldn't be allowed to even go to school. The only people that got to go to school were priests, so you had to be a man of the cloth, or you were a noble and you were rich. Everybody else was just destined to go work out in the field and do manual labor. But now we have that right to, to educate ourselves and to be whatever we want to be, whether it's an astronaut, a teacher, a doctor, a street worker, we can be anything that we want to be. And that's kind of neat. Now, if you look at this picture here, this is a picture of a philosoph. Another vocab word. What does that word sound like? Philosopher, you remembered. Good job. Okay. A philosoph is a philosopher, only it's in French. So we had Greek philosophers like Aristotle and Socrates, right? But now we're talking about philosophers, the brilliant minds, in this case, in France, because that's where this unit is really from. Okay, so let's look at our definition of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was an intellectual movement. What does intellectual mean? Brains, smart people. It's a smart movement. Good. Sorry, my pen died on me a second. A smart movement. 
in Europe, and in particular, we are talking about France and England. Remember, the Renaissance started in Italy. So we're kind of shifting now to France and England during the 18th century, which is what hundreds? 1700s, good, you're getting better at that. That led to a whole new worldview. They saw things in a whole new light. If you look at this painting, this is a picture of a salon. And if you'll notice, they're not getting their hair done or their nails, right ladies? A salon is a little different today than it was back then. Back then, a salon was, in my words, a thinking party. So it would be like saying, all right, everybody, come to Terpster's house tonight, and when we get there, we're going to debate whether we think God exists. Does that sound like fun? And we're going to discuss it and debate and argue. That's what a salon was. They would go there and they would discuss some of the big issues of the world, like how do we exist? Is our government good? Do they give people rights or not? Should women be equal to men? They discuss all those big issues. And in order to have a, a successful salon, you had to have at least one famous philosoph in attendance. Today, it would be like inviting, I don't know, Bill Gates to my party. Back then, it was inviting people like Voltaire or Descartes or Diderot, people like that to your party. And if you did that, people would talk about your party for months and months on it because you had a very good salon. Now, in this painting, you'll see that there is a bust or statue of a person back here. It's kind of important because this is a statue of a guy named Voltaire. Recognize that name, maybe? A little bit. He was the most popular philosoph of the Enlightenment, and he was invited to more salons than you could count. And I will tell you, the guy that was the most brilliant at this party was the guy that got the chicks, because it was cool to be smart, and the girls liked that. So, kind of neat. All right, so let's start out with our brilliant minds. We're going to start with Immanuel Kant, K A N T. Immanuel Kant is known as the father of the Enlightenment. He is known as the father because he was the first person to really tell people to challenge your minds. That it's not okay to just say, oh, let's say that your parents raised you in the church, for example, and just accept, well, yep, I'm a Methodist because my parents were, or I believe in God because my parents did. He said, no, ask the questions yourself. What do you really believe? Do you believe in what this church stands for? Do you believe in what our government stands for? Use your own brain, your own thinking, and come up with your own reason. He was really encouraging that. He is known for this saying right here, saper aud, which means dare to know. They're encouraging you to ask the question, how did we get here on this earth? They're encouraging you to ask the question, why do I have to go to school? Why do I have to take world history as a requirement? It's okay to ask those questions and figure out what you think is the answer. He was the guy that encouraged that. Now I told you I'll help you out with your philosophical book to start with. So now that you have these in your notes, what I'd like you to do is find Kant in your book, and you're going to just write a very short, bulleted uh, synopsis of what he was famous for. So I would write two things about him. What do you think they are? Yep, number one, bullet, father of the Enlightenment. So put that under Kant, father of the Enlightenment. And what would be the second thing, do you suppose? Saper Aud means dare to know. Good. Saper Aud means dare to know. Remember that your names should be in pretty lettering, colors, all that. But when you're writing your definitions, as long as you write it neatly with pencil or pen, that's fine. Okay.
Is there anybody that was absent the day we did our philosoph books? Okay. okay, we all good? Okay. Now we mentioned this when we talked about our themes in this chapter, but also during this time period, the scientific revolution just exploded because they're thinking outside the box, which means they're coming up with new inventions and new discoveries. And that's why we're doing scientist poems on Wednesday in the lab, because science just boomed. Now remember that the scientific uh, revolution happened a little bit earlier than the regular enlightenment. It was in the 16th and 17th century. So it started before the enlightenment and then went into the enlightenment. Now, without looking down here, any of you seen a picture of this thing up on the board? I know, I think I saw it on a science textbook once. Do you know what it's used for? Sure, any idea? It is a globe, you're right, Anthony. Not space, but you're close. Not not out to stars. What is what was exploration back then? Out to sea, yeah, out to sea. So if you were a captain of a ship, this is how they kept track of where they were going and how to get where they were headed. They would follow one of these paths on this armillary. Isn't that cool? I didn't know that until I taught this class. All right, our next person is Francis Bacon and the scientific method. You recognize that from your science classes? He again was one of those philosophers that said, you know what? We need to throw off all the background that we have and use reason, use our own brain to figure things out. Because remember that before the enlightenment, science was a mix of science, but then if they couldn't explain it, they explained it as magic, right? And they believed in magic. That's why they believed in witchcraft, because they thought, well, what else would explain this person going psycho and killing a bunch of people? Wouldn't have anything to do with the fact that you might have a mental illness or that you were raised really odd, but it was magic, it was witchcraft. So they believed in that. This guy said that is a bunch of bull, bunch of bull crap, man. He said, we need to actually look and figure out why things happen the way they do. So we really pushed the science world. He said, we need to observe. We need to then experiment. We need to have a hypothesis. They sound familiar, don't they? All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Without peeking, I want you with your neighbor to see if you can write down the six steps of the scientific method that you use in your labs in science class. I'll give you about a minute to write down as many of those as you can. Okay, let's see the answers and see how you did. Now, these are the answers I got from Mr. Lovren because obviously it's been a long time since I have taken science classes. But he said, you start out with a purpose, right? I wanna study the effects of this blue liquid with this powder or something, I don't know. Okay, then I wanna observe how it's working, right? Then I have a hypothesis. I think that this liquid will turn green when included with this powder because it has this chemical reaction. Okay, then you experiment, then you analyze your data, right? You usually have to do it more than once, right? And then you have your conclusion. Now, Mr. Leverin also said that once you get to an upper level or a professional level, there is a seventh step. Does anybody know what that is? Yes, you're right. Some people call it, hold on. Some people call it share or publish, either one. And if you have all this knowledge and you just hide it in your lab, it's not helping the world, right? My brother is a bio researcher and he uses this all the time. He is always reading what this person did over in the Netherlands and this person did in Germany. And he starts from where they left off, then he publishes and they break off of what he did. So they use it all the time. Uh, 
Well, I saw it in the front, so I guess I know it's here in the base of the pen, but I don't know if it's so he didn't publish it. Uh -huh. so he thought of evolution, but he didn't publish, so he didn't get the credit. So number seven is important. Absolutely. Okay. So now write that in your booklet, right? Under Bacon, he's known for inventing the scientific method. Bacon. Yeah. Here's the problem. Look at this. Isaac Newton and the scientific method. They're both known for the scientific method. So the question is, what's the difference between Bacon and Newton? Newton is known for using the scientific method and making it famous. That's the difference. So while you have your booklet out, you might want to write that in there. Newton is known for using the scientific method and making it famous. You guys have probably studied Newton and really focused on what did he discover? Gravity, right? The theory of gravity, all that stuff. Okay, in this class, we're going to actually focus on something else that he discovered. He was so brilliant, okay? He was known for discoveries in math, physics, optics, like eyes, and lots, lots more, okay? But one of the things that we look at with his theories, he believed that not only should we use the scientific method, but we should use it in the social sciences. We should use the scientific method in the social sciences. Yep, those are just some of the areas he discovered or did new inventions in. So let's talk about what he means when he talks about using this method in the social sciences. So first of all, can you tell me what classes are under the umbrella in this high school of social sciences? Okay, sociology. What else? Not math, that'd be a different department. Psychology, good. What else? Yeah. Uh, actually, that would be under a different area. Yes, history. You are sitting in one of them right now. American history, world history are all under the social sciences. So what other classes are in our department? What did you take as a freshman? Geography, good, what else? What else do you need to take? American history, good, what else? Government, you take government. You also have to take something to do with money. You can take personal finance, which is in business, or economics. Economics is in our, in our branch. Others you can think of? Some electives. What does Grody teach? Do you know? Government and street law. Good. Current world issues that I teach is in this department. Um, America at War, Hollywood versus history. All those are social science classes. So now let's think about what he means when he says we can use this method here. All right. So sociology is the study of what? Anybody know? Yeah. It's the study of social groups in particular groups. Psychology is the study of what? Yep, the human mind. So let's say that I am a psychologist and I'm gonna try to apply the scientific method. Let's say my hypothesis is that serial killers do what they do because they were all beaten as young children. That's my hypothesis. Can I go and interview the families of different serial killers? Can I do that? Can I gather data? Can I, they might lie, that's true. But can I find research on that and figure out if I'm right or not? Sure you can. Sociology, a sociologist comes out onto Pine Ridge Reservation because they wanna know why there's such a high suicide rate. So their hypothesis might be because they had alcoholism in their family the suicide rate is higher. 
Can they go and research, find out how many families have alcohol in their family? Yeah, and eventually they can figure out whether they're right or they're wrong, right? That's exactly what he was talking about. What a brilliant guy that he thought we can use this in other areas. He's right, and we do it all the time. If you are a psychologist or a sociologist, your case studies are all based on scientific method. And he's the guy that came up with it. All right, now remember in our, our notes in the Renaissance, I said under certain slides, you need to highlight this slide or highlight it, right? Circle it, because it's important. This is one of those slides, okay? This slide is telling us the three main principles that you will see with all of our research in the Enlightenment. And they're actually written here, so you can kind of highlight them if you want. The first thing they said is that we need to throw off religion, tradition, and superstition. Get rid of it. Because a lot of us tend to, well, for, I'll give you an example. In my current world issues class, I have students that sometimes believe they're a Democrat because their parents are Democrats but they've never really looked at the issues and really tested themselves to see where they belong, okay? That would be an example of where tradition and the way I was brought up is affecting how I think. No, look at the issues, find out what you believe, what really is in your heart, what do you think, okay? The second thing they said is that we only accept knowledge based on observation, logic, and reason. It's all about logic and reason. And you notice what they say it is not based on. It is not based on faith. And that word can be a trigger word because we hear the word faith a lot in church, don't we? People that go to church, do you hear that word a lot? Have faith in God, right? Well, that became a problem because they said there is no faith when it comes to thinking in reason. And so the church, in particular the Catholic church, is going to fight this. They do not like these philosophers. They don't like the way that they're thinking because they're actually going up to their priests or their pastors and they're saying, why do we believe that adultery is wrong? Why do we believe in God? They're asking those questions. And back then you didn't ask those questions. Today, we encourage you to ask those questions, but back then that was a no-no. So they did not like the enlightenment. The third thing you'll see is that scientific and academic thought should be secular. I told you we'd have this word again. What does secular mean? Having to or not having to? Not having to do with the church. So non-religious, right? Non-religious. Now they're not saying you can't be a part of a church. That's not what they're saying. But they're saying you need to separate those things from what you truly are believing and figure it out, okay? All right, so those are our main principles. I'll give you a moment to write that down if you need to. Okay. On we go to another one of our brilliant minds. This is the Marquis de Condorcet, a very French name, can you tell? Yeah. He was a French mathematician, but he was known for a lot of other things, too. Um, first of all, he was a, a very important person for the French Revolution. He was a leader in the French Revolution, in particular on the government side. He is known for redesigning the education system. And he's also known for helping write the first French constitution. So he would be kind of like a George Washington in our culture. In France, Condorcet would be like that person.
All right, he is known for writing this particular piece, Sketch for a Historical Picture of the Progress of the Human Spirit. And in this writing, he had two main themes, okay? The first theme was that we need to use reason to discover the truth. Now we've heard that before. We've heard that already a lot. Reason is important. But then what he does is he twists it and adds his own little slant on things. The second thing that he said is that all humans can strive for perfection. in their life. All humans can strive for perfection in their life. Good, I like to see you guys taking good notes like that. You're gonna need it on this test. By the way, um, your test scores for chapter seven are in the grade book. I just have to check on a couple of you to see if you qualified for a prize for raising your grade. So I'll give those to you tomorrow, but they are in the grade book. It was very obvious. Either you studied and you did well, or you didn't study and you didn't. It was very obvious. And that's gonna be the same with this. Lots of people in this chapter, so you really gotta study, okay? Which is why we're doing our booklet. All right, so let's explain this second idea on the next slide. Can strive for perfection. What does he mean by that? Okay, under that, he basically had these two belief systems. He said, first of all, everybody should be educated. All people should be educated. But the reason for that is different. He said, all people should be educated because it will help make our life easier, more perfect. That's where he gets that word perfect. And this is how I paraphrase it so you can remember it. Here's what you need. It says, the more people, the more people we educate, the more discoveries we make. The more people we educate, the more discoveries we make. So let's show you what we mean by that, okay? Let's say that I only educate these four people right here in all of France. These are the only people that get to go to school, okay? Out of these four people, how many new inventions do you think we could get out of them? Maybe four if we're lucky, right? I mean, think about all the, the failures that Benjamin Franklin had before he got a winner, right? Now, maybe we have one person in here that's just gonna like, blow up the world and have like 10 new inventions, really awesome. But on average, we're lucky if we get one per person, right? Okay, not a lot to give to the world. But now imagine that I educate all of you. Now, how many inventions do you think we can come up with? Lots, right? And that's what he means. Because the more inventions we have, the more perfect life is. What are some inventions that have made life more perfect? What? Ah, the light bulb, electricity. The toilet has made life more perfect. Absolutely, I don't want to go to the outhouse. What else? What? Ah, printing press. Good, cotton gin. What else? Telegraph. Well, come on, what do you have with you every day? Your phone, right? Boy, have phones changed, right? And a computer on your phone, right? So computer. How about in the kitchen? Oh, that's not in the kitchen, but cars? What, stoves? What else is in the kitchen? Thank you, yes, a fridge. How about, thank goodness for microwaves, right? Or I would never survive. Oh. And dear God, I thank you for a dishwasher, right? I hate washing dishes. Has my dishwasher made my life more perfect? Yeah, that's what he means by perfection. 
your inventions make life more perfect. And it's true, isn't it? Yeah, they make our life better. So that's what Condorcet was talking about. Your inventions make life better. Good. All right. Now, they're kind of just showing you a bunch of other Enlightenment thinkers. Um, but basically, all you really need from this is not only were they philosophers, but they were also scientists. And they were also mathematicians. Many of them were good at a lot of these areas. Like Descartes was all three. He was good in all three areas. So they were really expanding their mind in a lot of different ways. So we're going to start out with my favorite. We're going to start out with Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes is one of those deep thinkers. And I like him because he has asked the questions that I think all of us have at some point in our life. He is known for this slogan, cogito ergo sum. Cogito ergo sum means, I think, therefore, I am. Yeah, you've heard this before. I think, therefore, I am. Now, what does that mean? This is what he did. He challenged everything in his life, even so much as to challenge, as I stand here, do I even exist? Maybe I'm just a figment of Emily's dream. Maybe I'm just living out her dream. Maybe I don't really exist. And he figured out he did, and this is why. It's because of this, he said, because I have separate thoughts from Emily, I must exist on my own, right? And that's where he came up with, I think, therefore, I am. I do exist. That's what that's from. He's also the person that would ask questions like, okay, so how did we get here on this earth? Some of you would say God created us. Okay, but then who created God? You ever thought about that? Or if you believe in the Big Bang Theory, that's all cool. Bunch of chemicals, little particles came together and went boom, here came the world, right? But then who invented the, the particles? Because something had to be before everything. Have you ever thought about that? Freaks me out. Didn't that freak you out a little bit? And that's exactly the kind of stuff that Descartes would think about. He was such a brilliant mind, really a deep writer. Oh my gosh, you should read this book. Oh, crazy. Very good mathematician too. We'll find that out later. So that was Rene Descartes. Now you bought, probably better catch up on your booklets real quick. I'll give you a minute to do that. There we go. Okay, now this lady that you see in this picture, you actually know about her already. This is the Madame de Pompadour. Do you remember in the movie Marie Antoinette, the lady with the really bright dresses that was sleeping around with the king? This is her, it's that hussy. That's her, yes. This is the mistress of Louis the 15th. So the question is, why did she make our notes? Well, she knew how to throw a party. She was known for having the best salons in all of Europe. She brought in the big names like Descartes, Voltaire, and people talked about her salons for miles and miles and miles. So she makes the notes because she had good salons. Yes. Yep, 